And we come together this day because Christ Jesus, our Lord, not only died for our sins, but because Christ is risen. Please stand for our call to worship. Our call to worship comes from Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, there is no God. There is only one God. He is the Lord. He is the King. He is the Redeemer. And he calls us here before him. Let us worship and sing before our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Amen. Go ahead. Please take your seats. Well, good morning. My name's Jeff. I'm one of the elders here at Truth Point, and as always, it's wonderful to be here with you. Um, I want to send a, send an, extend a special invitation or a greeting to those who may be with us for the first time. Um, we're glad that you're here with us, and we hope that you feel very welcome here. And likewise, if you're a regular attender, we're just so glad that you're here with us um, this morning. We've come to the point in our service where we have our time of prayer, but wanted to give you a quick update on something here in the church first. It's mostly good news, but um, a little bit of a twist. So many of you know Chris and Ashley Cartagena. Uh, they've been coming here for a long time. She pregnant, was pregnant with her first one, uh, but this week at 33 weeks of pregnancy, she started having strong contractions, and they tried to abate that, but um, were not able to. And so the good news is they welcomed Timothy Aaron into their family this week. We're very, very excited about it. Yes. We love babies here and want to support young families in particular as much as possible. However, uh, it is still quite early. So um, preliminary reports are that the baby and Ashley are both doing well, which is good. But they've asked, obviously, for prayer and support for us. And in particular, if anyone here um, medically, professionally has experience in that area or as a parent themselves has had a baby that's premature, they'd love to get connected with you just to, to kind of walk through what the next few weeks will look like. The baby is in NICU and likely will be there for at least, you know, a month, four, five, six weeks. So I'm going to put John Smith on the spot. If any of you can help that medically or personally, write to John Smith, his email is on the back, and then he will put you in touch uh, with, the Carta, with the Carta genus. Um, but with that said, let's go before our God right now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you now as your children to honor you and worship you and give you the glory that you deserve. You are the Almighty One, the eternal ruler of all, and yet you love us, you guide us and protect us, and you patiently listen to our prayers. You shower us with grace and forgiveness and forgiveness for our sins. And your mercy to us is more than we could hope for and more than we deserve. And through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, our sins are accounted for and we are reconciled to you. And as a result of being reconciled to you, we can daily live our lives in communion with you and your word, which in turn gives us an eternal sense of peace, hope, and joy in our hearts and our minds. And Father, on this Lord's Day, many of us are hurting and struggling and dealing with the challenges of our everyday lives. We take a moment of silence now to calm our hearts, to set aside our burdens, and to confess our sin to you. Father, thank you for forgiving us our sins. Thank you for giving us your holy word by which we can know you and understand the deep peace that to give to those who follow you. Please continue to reveal yourself to us more and more every day. Draw us close to you and encourage us. Father, mold us and shape us so that we can become more Christ-like. Let this church family be a bright gospel light in this community. Enable us to be full of the fruit of the Spirit to be so seasoned with your grace and love that those non-believers with whom we interact would be curious and want to know you more. Father, please strengthen the families in this church. Let our relationships with one another be sweet and full of grace and built on the common foundation of Christ. Father, we lift up a few uh, prayer requests specific to our church family right now. We pray for uh, Jude Scott, that you would continue to heal him. Father, we pray for the Mercier family as they seek to be reunited. Please allow the immigration paperwork to go through quickly and smoothly so that they can be together again. And Father, this morning in particular, we lift up the Cartagena family for Chris and Ashley and baby Timothy. Please keep them safe and healthy. Draw very near to them to comfort them in these coming weeks. Help us as a church family to provide loving care and support to them. Father, I also lift up Pastor Matt as he's preaching at a sister PCA church in Virginia this morning. Please enable him to proclaim the gospel boldly to them and also bring him back safely to West Palm Beach. And Father, bless Pastor Clint 
as he continues his series on the Ten Commandments, Father. Bless him and enable him to preach boldly to us this morning. We want to lift up a sister PCA church here locally, Sand Harbor Presbyterian. We pray that you would bless and guide Pastor Andrew Jacobson and the rest of the staff and leadership in that church. Enable them to be a bright gospel light in their community and give them wisdom as they lead and shepherd their congregation. And also, Father, we also think of our missionaries, Jake and Kate Grease, working with the Jesus Film Project. We praise you that their friend, Ryan, in East Asia, with whom they've built a relationship and shared the gospel with many times, professed a believing faith in you. Thank you for the encouragement and joy that they have in seeing a good friend come to know you. And we pray for the many church planters in the Middle East who go out to rural villages on motorcycles with backpacks containing video tablets and Bluetooth speakers and solar panels so that the gospel can be powerfully displayed in areas where previously it was unknown. Father, please keep them safe as they travel. Please allow the technology to continue to function well. And most importantly, use it in the Jesus film to call people to you in these rural villages. Finally, I pray that you would bless this service this morning, the worship and the preaching of the word and the offerings of your people. We pray these things by your spirit in the powerful name of our Savior Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our responsive reading this morning comes from Philippians chapter 3. Uh, you'll see it in your worship guide here. I will begin, and you all will respond uh, with the bold faced font there. So let's read the, the word of the Lord together here, starting in Philippians 3. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. Please rise as we continue to worship this morning. Sing it out. I stand. I stand. Amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Let's sing that again. I stand amazed. I stand amazed. In the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned and Singing how marvelous
whose face I at last shall see will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love. Praise the Lord that he is our firm foundation in and through Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment to greet those around us and pass the peace of Christ.
And now I would ask that you would remain standing and open your Bibles or worship guide to our sermon text. Please remain standing and open your Bibles or worship guide to our sermon text, which is Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3. Today we're going to be looking at the first commandment, the first commandment. And to have an understanding of the, the, the context of the text we're going to be reading, the Lord had brought the people out from Egypt. They had been slaves in Egypt. He brought them out through his miraculous power, through the, the Red Sea, through the desert. He provided for them in the desert. He brings them to Mount Sinai. And out Mount Sinai, he gives them the Ten Commandments. And just so we can understand the permanent, eternal nature of the Ten Commandments, God not only spoke these words, which is amazing enough, I mean, the people of Israel actually heard the audible voice of God speak these commandments, but also God wrote them in tablets of stone. And today we're going to be looking at the first of these Ten Commandments. Let's hear from the Word of God, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you, Father. We we're so grateful that you speak to us through your word. Thank you. We do ask now, Father, that you would help us to understand the depths and riches of these words, that you would work in our hearts, that we might have a better understanding, greater clarity of who you are and what you require of us. Bless this reading and now this preaching of your word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So I have a question to ask you. What is the first and greatest priority in your life? What's the first and greatest priority in your life? What is it that, that drives you in all that you do? What is it that guides you in the decisions and things that you do in life? Now, we're in a church service. Pastor Clint's preaching to you. So the answer is probably God, right? But notice, I didn't ask you what should be the first and greatest priority in your life. I asked what is. What is? We, as Christians, we know that God should be the first and greatest priority in our lives. But if we're honest with ourselves, as we look deep into our hearts, we recognize that too many times that's not the truth. Too many times we make ourselves number one. We make ourselves the priority in our lives. And this problem began all the way back with Adam and Eve when the devil told them, you can be like God. And that's exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to be like God, to make decisions on their own, decide for themselves what was right and wrong. And ever since then, their descendants, including us, we struggle with that. We struggle with keeping God first. There's this sinful desire to make ourselves first and foremost in our lives. And so God gives us 10 commandments. And in the first of these commandments... He gives us a command that helps us with the basics. You shall have no other gods before me. It's basically God's way of saying, he is to be our priority. He is to be first in our lives, in all areas, in everything that we do. He actually made us to be God-centered, to keep God first in our lives. But he knows that we don't always do that. And so this first commandment that he gives us is to bring us back to the basics. We're to keep him first. 
And this is for our own good. He gives us this commandment for our own good. And we can think of uh, and understand this, um, the, the reason why this is for our own good in much of the same way that we look at a relationship between a parent and their child. A, a young child, let's say six months or a year or two years, even up to five years, they get their identity from their parent, their protection from their parent, their provisions from their parent. Everything comes from their parents. Without their parents, they're, they're lost. They're hopeless. I really understood the significance of, of this uh, when I was five years old, and my mom uh, took me to the grocery store. Now, for you young people here, children, you're probably thinking, how could that guy with gray hair have ever been five years old? It's true I was. Just use your imagination. My beard was not gray at the time. So my mom took me to the grocery store, and she told me, she, she had one of those little hand baskets, and she told me, keep within arm's distance wherever I go. And so she's going up and down the aisles getting stuff, and I was doing great for a while. I was arm's distance away, and we got to this one aisle, and strategically placed on the lowest level was a small section of toys. And my, sure enough, my mom ends up stopping right next to that small section of toys, and she's reading the ingredients and in some item she was going to buy. And I look down, and there's this small metal red airplane that caught my eye. And I remember leaning down and picking that up, and I was fascinated with it. And I'm playing with it and, and just enjoying that. And after a while, I'm thinking, you know, I need to share with my mom how much I need this toy. And so I reached up and I grabbed her hand and I looked up into the face of a complete stranger. No idea who this lady was. I dropped her hand, I dropped the toy, it was no longer important. And I took off running, looking for my mom. So I share this rather embarrassing story because in the same way, God knows what's best for us and he tells us to keep our eyes on him, to keep him first in our lives. It's in him that we find our identity, our provisions, our protection. He is our everything. In him we live and move and have our being. He knows what's best for us. And so he's telling us, keep our eyes on him in this commandment. Because he knows that when we keep our eyes on him, we won't be distracted by the things of the world, by those shiny objects of the world. And without him, we are truly hopeless, helpless, and lost. The problem is, is in my case, my mom had walked away from me. <laughs> she had continued her shopping and didn't realize I wasn't next to her. But in our case, we run from God. You see, we want to make ourselves first, and we actually run away from God, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. They sinned. What was their first instinct? Get away from God. I know what I'm doing is not right, so I'll feel better about myself putting a little distance between us. We think we know better. We think putting ourselves as number one will make everything all right but it does not. Now, I'm happy to report to you that five-year-old me found my mom, and she comforted me. There was a lot, great deal of tears, but she comforted me, and uh, our relationship was restored. What's so different with God is even though we've run from him, what he does right now through his word, through this commandment, it's as if he's standing in front of that lost child and he's saying, listen to me. I'm here now. Come to me. Run back to me. Listen to what I have to say to you. We are to keep him first. He tells us, make him the center of our lives. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at two aspects of this command, the demands and the blessings of this commandment. 
And through that, we're going to see just how rich this commandment is. So we're going to look at the demands and the blessings. First, we're going to look at the demands. Now, it's interesting. You know, most people will look at this commandment. They say, you shall not, uh, or you shall have no other gods before me. And they think, that's, for them, it's not really the greatest commandment. Like, there's other commandments that actually make more sense to them. You think of, like, the commandment, um, you shall not steal. Okay, well, that one's concrete. I know what I'm supposed to do and not do there. But this one here, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. And we kind of think, okay, well, I'm not living in the time of the Israelites when there were pagan nations making these wooden and metal idols. So, I mean, really, how does this commandment apply to my lives? How important is it? Well, not only <laughs> is it important, of all the commandments, this is probably the greatest commandment because it's overarching. It includes everything else. This commandment gives great demands from the very beginning and then through the rest of the commandments. So what demands does this commandment make on our lives today, right? We don't see metal or wooden idols out there, so what are the demands it makes on our lives today? The first demand is to love God with all of our being. The first demand is to love God with all of our being. Now, you can look at that commandment and say, okay, Clint, I don't get it. I don't see the word love in there. So where are you getting this from? Well, throughout Scripture, we're told to love God. Over and over again, love God. Um, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And what was his answer? Love the Lord your God, right? Because of this, theologians have said that the command to love God is really an exposition of the first commandment. The command to love God is really an exposition or, or an explanation of the first commandment. So, for example, Sinclair Ferguson, he says regarding Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, he says, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 is an explanation of Exodus 20, verse 3. They're related. You can't separate the two ideas. To keep God first in our life is to love him with all of our being. What does Deuteronomy 6 say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. There's one God, and because there's only one God, we are to love him with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength. So this commandment is, is telling us to love God with all of our being. Now, I have to point something out here. I, I know I've done this before in the past some time ago. I need to clarify about love. You see, in our world today, when most people think of love, they think love is a feeling. But biblical love, it includes feeling, but biblical love, first and foremost, is choice and, choice and sacrifice. Choice and sacrifice. In Romans 5, 8, we read that uh, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, let's think about what biblical love is. God shows his love in that while we were still sinners, how does God feel about sin? He hates it, right? How should he feel about us? Should hate us. But what does he do? He chooses to love us. And then what happens? Christ died for our sins. There's sacrifice. So biblical love is choice and sacrifice. What does that mean for us? We're told to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. That means we have to make choices to love God. You see, it's not a matter of, yeah, I just, I'm just not feeling it today. Well, if you don't do anything about it, you're never going to feel it. 
we're told to make the choice to love God. Sometimes that means making sacrifices in our time, in our entertainment, in, in different areas of our life, so that we're making time for God. Those feelings will come. But biblical love is first choice and sacrifice. Now, someone might be thinking, okay, I understand we're supposed to love God, but doesn't God also tell us to love other people, right? I mean, he tells us to, he tells husbands to love their wives, fathers and parents to love their children. So is that kind of the same way we're supposed to love God? Well, yes and no. You see, the love that God tells us about here or is demanding here is one of priority. He is to be our greatest love. And this is why verses like Matthew 10, 37 say uh, that the person who loves their father or, the, or mother more than me, more than God, is not worthy of me. The one who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is a love of priority. Listen, I'm a parent. I'd give my life for any one of my children. Sometimes they get hurt or things happen, and I think to myself, I would rather have that happen to me than my child. I love my children. But God tells us that we are to love him way beyond that. It's not that we don't love our children. We're just not supposed to love them more than God. God is our great priority. So the demand of this commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, is that we are to love him, that choice and sacrifice, more than anything or anybody else. The demand to love God also spills into a second area, and that is service. We don't just love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We also serve him in the same way. And this is why we find verses like 1 Corinthians 10, 31, where we're told whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of who? To God. Do all to the glory of God. So in the smallest areas of life, whether it's just eating or drinking or whether it's anything else, work or whatever it might be, it is all to be done for God's glory and honor. And this is why we have verses like Galatians 2.20 that say, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Everything that we do in life is to be for God and through Jesus Christ. What are the demands of this commandment? As we see this commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The idea is the, the, this demand of loving God and serving God with all that we have, every fiber of our being. And so then we, we need to ask ourselves again, am I doing that? Am I keeping God first and foremost in every area of my life? Or am I making myself first? Am I putting the things that I want to do above the things of God. When we do that, when we place ourselves first, when we make ourselves first and foremost in our lives, it's no different than a spouse who walks up with a lover between, before their husband or wife and s expects them to accept the lover. No, that's repugnant. I mean, that's horrifying. We would never accept that. And that should never be acceptable before our Lord and God either. He tells us, you shall have no other gods before him. What does he demand? He demands that we love and serve him with every ounce of our being. Now, this commandment doesn't just have demands, it also has blessings. So the demands are very clear and absolute. The blessings are also very clear for us as well. And we see these in verse 2. In verse 2, the, the first blessing that we're going to see is in the first half of uh, verse 2. And it's, it's the blessing of relationship. In this commandment, he gives us the blessing of relationship. So in verse 2, he says, 
in the first four words, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Now notice when you read the word Lord, it's all in capital letters, L-O-R-D. That's because that's the translation for the Hebrew word Yahweh. It's a name. It's actually God's name. So what's being said here, God is basically saying, I am Yahweh. He's giving his personal name. Now, the name of God also conveys meaning. So Yahweh has the meaning of I am or I am who I am. It basically conveys this idea that he has no beginning. He has no end. He has no need for anybody or anything. He's independent of all things. He's the creator of all things. But it's a personal name. And so, like a personal name, like the, the name of, of anybody, whether it's um, Stephen or Leanne or whatever it would be, it's a, God is giving his personal name to his people. So when you meet someone, you ask for their name. That's a special communication that's going on. God is communicating with his people, giving his name. But then he goes on. He says, I am the Lord, your God. Now, there's a sense in which you can say God is the God of all people on earth because he made all things. But what we need to remember here is that God is speaking to Israel. He spoke to Israel these words. These are the people of the covenant who had been told over and over again, I will be your God and you will be my people. Over and over again. And God's telling them, I'm going to be your God. You, I'm your God. You're my people. And with that blessing comes the idea of dwelling. That God would dwell with them. And then immediately after this, what do we find the Israelites doing? Making a tabernacle. And what does God do? He dwells in the midst of his people. And they build a, eventually they build a temple. And God dwells in his midst with the, of his people. And then eventually, Jesus Christ came. He tabernacled amongst his people. And then he went to heaven. He sent his spirit into his people's hearts. And he says, I will never leave you. Ever. He tabernacles with us. And so this idea here is that God is giving us a personal relationship. And so in the commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, it's because we have a unique special relationship with the one and only God, a personal relationship with him. No one else is to be treated like God because he has given us a personal relationship with him. But then we see that the blessings go on. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out, up or brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. So just as God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, by his miraculous power and freed them in the same way, he frees us. He saves us from Satan and sin. And he makes us free, free to follow after him. And, this, and the same power that he used in those miracles, in bringing them through the Red Sea, that power of God works within our lives. And we see this, the Father making this plan of salvation and choosing us before the foundation of the world. And then God the Son coming in the person of Jesus Christ, living a perfectly righteous and holy life, dying on the cross where he took the full conse consequences of our sins upon him. Then dying. But rising from the grave three days later, ascending into heaven where he continues to intercede for his people. And in the work of the Holy Spirit, who applies the salvation to our lives, enab enabling us not only to read Scripture, but to understand it, changing our hearts, uniting us to God, uniting us to one another, and enabling us to walk in holiness and righteousness. Doing what? 
keeping God first. How do we get that ability to keep God first? Well, he helps us by giving us his spirit. We are blessed. Just as the Israelites could not save themselves. I mean, how long were they in Egypt? 400 years. I mean, it was just an indication. There was no way these guys could save themselves. In the same way, we can never save ourselves from our sins. Our sins are against God. We become enemies of God. There's no possible way. We need a miracle. And God gives it to us himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And God knows what's best for us. He knows that for our own good, we need this commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. We are to make him first and foremost in our lives. Why? Because he's the only one that has saved us, continues to save us, and will save us. There is no other. God gives us this commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Demanding that we love and serve him and giving us the blessings of a relationship with him and saving us from our sins. So we need to go back to our original question. Am I keeping God first in my life? This is what this commandment is all about. In, in a sense, this commandment is like Christianity 101. This, this is the basics. This is what it's all about. God made us to walk with him. God made us to keep our eyes and focus on him. God made us to keep him first in our lives. Now, I know some people have told me, well, that just seems kind of cold and harsh. I mean, that God would tell us to keep him first. Well, the truth of the matter is, God tells us to keep him first because he knows what's best for us. He knows it's for our own good. He is that loving father with his children, telling them what is best for them. And so we are to obey this command. But hopefully the thing that will motivate us more than just kind of cold obedience is understanding that we obey this commandment because God is worthy. He is worthy. I mean, think about it. God is self-sufficient. He is almighty. He doesn't need anything. And he calls us into a relationship of love with him. He tells us to love him in the same way that he has loved us. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. Again, he doesn't need anything, but he calls us to serve him. We get the privilege to work with God. It's not, a, we need to change our mentality sometimes. It's not like I have to do God's work. No, it's we get to do God's work. It's exciting, it's a joy, it's a privilege that we get. He doesn't need us. We have the privilege of being drawn in to work with God. God is eternal and infinite. There's no end to him. Yet he calls us into a personal relationship with him where he dwells with us today, tomorrow, and forever. This is an amazing God. And he is a God who is holy and righteous and just. He will do that which is right. But he extends to us his mercy and grace, forgiving us for our sins through the work of Jesus Christ. As we understand the the demands and the blessings of this commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. May we see that it's for our own good. But 
may we be driven to obey as we recognize that we keep God first because he is worthy. Amen? Let's pray. Almighty Father, we come before you praising and thanking you for your word. But Lord, we also recognize that too many times we do not apply your word to our lives as we should. Too many times we have made ourselves first and foremost in our lives. And so, Lord, we ask for forgiveness. We ask that you would cleanse us from our wrongdoings. And we ask for that forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are told that when we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to cleanse us from our sins and wash us from all iniquity, all un unrighteousness. We thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, that through the power of your Spirit, that you would help us day after day to keep you first and foremost in our lives. And may we stand in awe of who you are as we keep our eyes on you. We love you, Father. We praise you. And we lift this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, if our music team uh, and our, the officers who will be serving communion would please come forward. And as we prepare ourselves to take from the table of the Lord, let us profess our faith, declaring the faith that, the, that Christians throughout the ages have declared in the Apostles' Creed. And so I ask you, brother and sister, I ask you, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare to take from this table, it's important for us to remember and to recognize that Keeping God first in our lives is not easy. We're sinful beings. We struggle with sin. But God knows that, and so he gives us help. And he gives us help in this table. The bread and cup representing the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ who died upon the cross to take away our sins helps us because when we fail, the Lord reminds us that we are forgiven. As we repent and turn to the Lord, he offers us forgiveness in Christ. But then he has us take this meal on a regular basis because he also recognizes that we need strength. And so we take this meal as, as a reminder that he, he feeds our strength. He feeds our faith, helping us to be strong, to keep him first and foremost. And as we take this meal, we're reminded that we are united to God. Just as we, as we ingest this meal and it becomes part of us, it reminds us that in the same way, we are united to God through Christ. We're also united with one another. We are one family. And so we take this meal today as a reminder that we're forgiven, that we're united to God, to one another, and that he strengthens us that we might keep him first. And he doesn't want us to forget. So he tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please stand. The way we'll do this is uh, you'll come to your left and then down the aisle to the table in front of your section. Uh, but know that, well, you'll receive the elements and return to your seat. We'll all part participate together. But know that this table is for those who have faith in Jesus Christ, those who are believing, professing, baptized members of a, a Christian church, not just our church, but any Christian church. This table is for you. If that is not you, please just pass the table by or, or return or remain in your seat. We are thrilled that you're here. We're excited that you're hearing about Jesus Christ and the gospel and about our Lord through his word. But know that the teaching of Scripture is very clear that this table will not do you any good if you take from it without faith in Jesus Christ. So pass it by or remain seated. And uh, I hope you'll take time to read through the prayers that are listed the, there for those who are not communing. And now for the family of God, those who have faith in Jesus Christ, come to the table of grace, beginning with the first rose.
Let's pray. Almighty Father, we come before you praising you and thanking you for meeting our needs in every way possible. We thank you for this table that you have prepared before us in and through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask that you would bless the bread and the cup for the very special purpose for which you have given it to us today. And that as we take of this meal, Lord, that it would strengthen our faith, helping us to keep you first and foremost in our lives and recognizing the forgiveness that we have from our sins. We ask this through the power of your Holy Spirit and the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the body of Christ, we are united to God and to one another. Take, eat, remember, and believe. In the blood of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven from all of our sins, all of them. Take, drink, remember, and believe. And now please stand as we continue to lift our voices up to our Lord.
God's people said. Amen. Be thou my vision. As we do that, we're keeping God first and foremost in our lives. That is our calling. And we know that God helps us in that calling. He forgives us when we fail, but he gives us strength to do it, to keep him first and foremost in every area of our lives. And he sends us out with his blessing upon us. So please receive the blessing of the Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And God's people said, go in peace.